Welcome to part one of our five part series on plantar fasciitis. If you've been told you have plantar fasciitis, you're definitely going to want to watch this entire series for two reasons. The first is that we're going to make sure you are doing the right treatments and not wasting your time and money. And second, there's a really good chance that you've been misdiagnosed. We're going to walk you through everything that is wrong with how you got diagnosed and what you could actually have. Hey, it's Glenn here from Nehab, the world's leading physical therapy alternative, where we educate and empower you to take control of your recovery. If you're new here, make sure you click that subscribe button, and all the links we mentioned in the video can be found in the description below. As always, this information is meant for educational and demonstration purposes only. With that out of the way, let's get into it. I've treated patients with and personally experienced plantar fasciitis. I did and gave the traditional treatments, and eventually they and I got better but something didn't seem quite right. So today I'm going to clear up some misinformation and give you the real deal on everything plantar fasciitis. Make sure you watch all the videos to help you understand your problem and why I believe you could have been misdiagnosed. The plantar fascia is more accurately called the plantar aponeurosis. It's a thick fibrous layer of tissue on the bottom of your foot that's divided into three bands, medial, lateral, and central. Its job is to stabilize the arch of the foot and provide some shock absorption. Plantar fasciitis is believed to be the inflammation of the plantar fascia from overstretching or overloading. While that is sort of true, it is usually caused by a cascade of events. The suffix itis implies inflammation. However, biopsies show tissue degeneration versus inflammation. Therefore, a more appropriate term is plantar fasciosis. There can be an inflammatory response, which typically lasts around 3-7 to seven days. So symptoms beyond a week without a re-aggravation or re-injury are unlikely to be due to inflammation. This explains why there is usually little to no change with anti-inflammatories and why cortisone shots are not often effective beyond one month. So what is the cause of plantar fasciitis? You will hear all types of reasons for why you got plantar fasciitis. Calf weakness, ankle weakness, tight hips, misaligned hips, you pronate too much, you supinate too much, it's your shoes, it's high arches, no, it's from flat feet. The reality is it is rare that any of these things actually matter. You didn't just develop pronation or flat feet. Calf weakness or tightness doesn't happen unless there's a serious neurological event. These quote unquote problems have been with you for decades. Most people with flat feet or overpronation have had it their entire life. And your plantar fasciitis started a few months ago but now all of a sudden pronation or flat feet is causing it. Why didn't it happen 10 years ago? It doesn't make much sense. Pronation is the classic villain in this movie and in many movies in fact. If you were to believe what everyone says, having pronation is essentially the beginning of the end. Apparently it's the cause of foot pain, ankle pain, knee pain, hip pain, back pain, and some will even claim it can cause shoulder and neck pain. It's just not true. The reality is that it's never been proven to be the cause of any of these things. People that pronate and people that supinate both get plantar fasciitis. It's what everyone says, but the claims are not supported. Pronation does not necessarily lead to lower extremity problems, and research has found that excessive pronators are no more likely to get injured than those without it. Tight calves. This is another classic condition blamed for causing plantar fasciitis, but again there is very poor correlation. Tightness is really just a sensation and stretching only alters that sensation, giving the perception of being looser. Stretching in itself is a misconception we'll cover in another post, but stretching does not actually change tissue length, at least not permanently. It can temporarily decrease the stiffness of tissue. Given that stretching does not change tissue length, that the plantar fascia needs your toes bent backwards to increase tension, and that there is no direct connection between the plantar fascia and the Achilles tendon, it seems that tight calves have little to do with it at all. In theory, if having tight calves was actually a thing, it could cause earlier weight transfer to the forefoot and the toes, but most people compensate with shorter step length and external rotation of the foot. Weight has also been correlated to plantar fasciitis, with research reporting overweight people are at a greater risk of developing it. My question is, is it purely weight or load that causes plantar fasciitis, or is it related to the composition of that weight? What is its prevalence in lean people with high body weight, like a bodybuilder? And why does it not happen to all overweight people? This indicates that weight increases alone and not suffice. Weight is usually gained gradually and tissue will adapt to the increased stress, a subject we will touch on later in the series. 
It is clear that weight alone is not enough in and of itself to cause plantar fasciitis. With increased body fat, there is an associated chronic low-level inflammation that has been shown to weaken collagen. This results in lowering a tissue's tolerance to stress, and thus an increased likelihood of damage. This could reasonably explain why the prevalence is higher with obesity. It may be activity related, as tissue will adapt and get stronger if progressively loaded. A more sedentary lifestyle may limit the ability of the tissue to develop resistance to forces. Age. There is a body of literature on the association of plantar fasciitis with increasing age. Age-related degenerative changes may cause a decrease in the elasticity and the ability to absorb shock, resulting in the plantar fascia being more prone to injury. Additionally, older athletes seem to suffer from plantar fasciitis more often than younger athletes. Systemic diseases and disorders play a role in decreasing the tolerance of connective tissue to forces. Factors that affect microcirculation of blood, such as hardening of the arteries, abnormal lipid profiles, tobacco use, and diabetes have all been linked to an increased risk of developing plantar fasciitis. People with immune system diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis, have also been shown to have an increased risk. Overuse and overload. The primary belief of the cause of plantar fasciitis is overloading and thus overstretching of the tissue, resulting in damage. And I agree that this is likely, however, what I disagree with is which structure is actually damaged. All injuries are simply the result of exceeding a tissue's tolerance. This could be a one-time high force event like a fall or a car accident, or a repetitive low load event as in the case of overuse injuries. If you think back to the start of your symptoms, there's usually a precipitating event, such as a large increase in activity, such as joining a gym, increased work or prolonged walking, rapid weight gain or illness. There is typically something that triggers it. It's pretty clear that the cause of plantar fasciitis is multifactorial. It explains why the demographics since precipitating events vary so much. As stated earlier, I believe that the injury occurs as a result of tissue's tolerance being exceeded. It is also clear that there are systemic factors that lower tissue tolerance, making normally harmless activities now enough to damage the tissue. This falls in line with the popular overuse overload theory, but I believe it is not the plantar fascia that gets damaged in every person. In fact, I believe it is actually rarely the plantar fascia. We rely heavily on assessment, diagnostic tools, and the reports to get an accurate diagnosis for all kinds of conditions. As with everything, some are better than others. Some are touted as the gold standard. However, being the gold standard or the best assessment tool does not always mean it's the most accurate. It just means it's the best we have right now. It seems pretty clear that no one is exactly sure what causes plantar fasciitis. To make things even more confusing, the tools used to diagnose it are just as unclear. Palpation. Palpation is often used in the determination of plantar fasciitis, but its validity is overstated. Palpation in general has been shown to be a poor assessment tool for most conditions. The foot, and in particular the bottom of the foot, is very sensitive and capable of detecting the slightest pressures. If you have ever gotten sand or a small stone in your shoe, you will know exactly how sensitive it is. Without looking, you know exactly where it is, what it is, whether it's a stick or a stone, whether it's hard or soft, sharp or dull. Clinicians will press the underside of the heel called the calcaneal tuberosity and associate a pain response with plantar fasciitis. However, while the plantar fascia has some attachment here, several intrinsic foot muscles also attach to the calcaneal tuberosity. So how do you know what is actually causing the pain? Well, you don't. Pain can be provoked with palpation even in people without plantar fasciitis and does not always mean that there's a problem or tissue damage. As mentioned, it is also inaccurate in determining which structure is the problem, especially in the case like this where there are multiple structures layered in the same location. X-ray. Radiographs aka x-rays are a cheap and fast way to get some insight. Often heel spurs are seen on the images and associated with plantar fasciitis. However, this is not always true. I would tend to believe that it's almost always untrue. There are many people that have heel spurs without any symptoms. Spurs take a long time to develop, so it's more than likely you've had it long before the onset of your symptoms. An interesting side note is that heel spurs actually appear below or deep to the plantar fascia, where the foot muscles attach, and the surgical removal of bone spurs has not been shown to decrease pain, so the general consensus is that they are irrelevant. Diagnostic ultrasound and MRI. 
An ultrasound or an MRI is the go-to assessment tool for measuring plantar fascia thickness, which studies have related to plantar fasciitis. The standard rule for the interpretation is that a plantar fascia with a thickness greater than 4 mm is indicative of plantar fasciitis. However, several studies have also shown plantar fascia thicknesses up to 7 mm in people without pain. A small study of endurance runners found thicknesses over 4 mm in 41% of the subjects without pain, meaning they had abnormal plantar fascia per the ultrasound, but no symptoms. 48% showed structural abnormalities ranging from mild regions of fluid collection to partial thickness tears, again without any symptoms. I question the accuracy of measuring thickness from ultrasound images. Like anything with human interpretation, they are prone to human error. And when dealing with poorly defined structures on a screen and literally fractions of a millimeter between a 3.5 millimeter normal reading and a 4 millimeter pathologic reading, I would be hesitant to hang my hat on the reliability of those results. No standardized instrumentation or procedures have ever been created for measuring the plantar fascia. And the threshold of 4 millimeters is not a valid measure. It's just a number that's used because that's just the number that you use. Interestingly, foot position will also alter the thickness of the plantar fascia. A relaxed foot has the greatest plantar fascia thickness and with the foot dorsiflex or pulled up and the toes extended, creates the thinnest state. This means that even slight variations in foot and toe position could easily influence the thickness, shifting someone from normal to abnormal. Thickening has also been shown to occur with regular activity and repetitive loading, showing that thickening of the plantar fascia is not always related to pathology. Does thickening of the plantar fascia even matter? Clearly it does not 100% indicate plantar fasciitis. Is it a normal adaptive response to loading? No one truly knows, but I would bet that in most cases it's actually a natural occurrence that is either a normal variant or an adaptation to activity. As you can clearly see now, the diagnosis of plantar fasciitis is not as cut and dry as it's made out to be. I've said it before, but medicine is no different from gambling. Providers gather information to take an educated guess on what has the greatest statistical likelihood of being the winner. Unfortunately, in this case, the information they're getting is flawed, and their bet is not a sure thing. There are so many people telling you how to treat plantar fasciitis, it can be hard to figure out what works and what's just snake oil. Unfortunately, in an attempt to recover quickly, people try anything and everything. With anyone swearing that their technique or product fixes plantar fasciitis, they're gonna give it a try. Trying multiple treatments at once is a problem in itself, whether it's evidence-based or not, as it provides no clarity on the effectiveness of any particular treatment. If you do five things and get worse, what made you worse? There is no way to know. The more interventions you have, the muddier the waters become, making it impossible to actually understand how your body is reacting. Part of the problem is, as we mentioned earlier, Diagnostic testing is flawed. Combine that with the multifactorial causes of plantar fasciitis and the thousands of fixes available, it is no wonder people are confused about what to do. After going over the current treatment options, I'm gonna tell you what I believe is a commonly overlooked cause of plantar foot pain and what you should be doing to help fix it, calf stretches. One of the most commonly prescribed treatments for plantar fasciitis are calf stretches, but its recommendation doesn't really fit. The premise behind the calf stretching is that the plantar fascia and the Achilles tendon are connected, when in reality they are very rarely in direct contact, especially in adults. They do both attach to the periosteum, which is a connective tissue layer that covers bone, but that's about as close as they get. The relationship between them is that increased load on the Achilles tendon also increases load on the plantar fascia. An example is standing on the entire foot versus standing on your tiptoes. When standing on your foot, there is minimal tension on the Achilles tendon and some on the plantar fascia. Standing on your tiptoes increases Achilles tendon and plantar fascia load. The plantar fascia is under the most tensile load when the toes are extended as occurs with the push off phase of walking or running. As mentioned in part one, stretching is another one of those subjects buried in misconceptions, the biggest being that it lengthens tissue. This belief has been debunked and while there is a temporary increase in tissue length during stretching, it returns to its normal position shortly after. Stretching has been shown to decrease the stiffness of muscles and tendons for a brief period of time. But the main mechanism for flexibility increases is an improved tolerance to the discomfort of stretching. This is why under anesthesia, joints have full range of motion as the protective mechanism for overstretching is turned off. Icing is fine if you like to do it, 
but it doesn't actually fix anything and has no negative or positive effects on recovery. What it can do is temporarily decrease your symptoms, which is both positive and negative. While it can help make weight bearing tasks more tolerable due to its numbing effect, it can lead to overdoing it and causing injury and prolonging recovery. Pain mitigation. This part is purely our opinion and we recommend that you always follow your physician's instructions regarding pain relievers. The problem with pain relievers is much like icing, they alter your ability to detect if too much stress is being placed on the healing structures. This can result in injury which starts the entire healing process over again. It would be similar to having your car engine start grinding while you're driving and just turning up the radio so you can't hear it. Just because you can no longer detect it, it doesn't mean that it's fixed and you're probably causing more damage. Plantar fascia stretching. The plantar fascia is an incredibly strong fibrous tissue designed to support our entire body weight. Performing plantar fascia stretches in non-weight bearing will have little to no impact on it. The tensile load applied from this form of stretching typically does not have enough force to alter anything that just wiggling your toes wouldn't do. What it might do is provide some desensitization to the pain or prepare the foot for bearing weight. But that's a big mite. Another point of confusion is that they say plantar fasciitis is caused by overstretching. But now stretching fixes it. Well which is it? Does it cause it or does it fix it? Massage, trigger point release, soft tissue mobilization. Pressing, pushing or prodding in a normal foot can be painful in itself as we talked about in the diagnostics portion of the series. And having soft tissue work by your therapist can provoke pain that they can attribute to plantar fasciitis. Palpation and its use for the assessment of taut bands, adhesions and trigger points is essentially disproven and is one of the lowest forms of assessment. While there are benefits to therapeutic touch, there is no significant evidence for these interventions being effective for plantar fasciitis, especially over exercise alone. Any claims are mostly anecdotal. If anything, it could help desensitize structures in those with chronic plantar fasciitis. But desensitization takes months of consistent daily stimulation to occur. Let me be clear. In no way do these things release adhesions, break up trigger points, or break down scar tissue, despite what practitioners may claim. Therapeutic ultrasound. Despite the abundance of evidence against the efficacy of therapeutic ultrasound, it continues to be used expansively in the physical therapy world. As is with other conditions, therapeutic ultrasound has shown no benefit to plantar fasciitis. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy. The quality of evidence for or against shockwave therapy is not great. Several studies have shown it to be no better than placebo, while others have shown some improvement. The use of shockwave therapy currently lacks the quality and consistency to support its unconditional use. The research is clear that it should be considered as a last-ditch conservative option, especially as it is expensive and not covered by insurance, and how painful it is. It could be used for those that have failed to respond to appropriate conservative care within six months. Injections. Some research has shown short-term benefit for symptoms within one month of onset. However, long-term outcomes are the same whether you have an injection or not. If cortisone is stacked with a numbing agent such as lidocaine, which dulls the ability to detect pain, some initial symptom relief could be attributed to that. There are a few risks reported with injections, including a risk of rupturing the fascia or fat pad atrophy, with increasing risk with repeated injections. Remember, symptom relief beyond one month has not been demonstrated in research. Orthotics. The jury is out on orthotic use. Often recommended with the intention of correcting pronation, as reported in our other videos, the claim of pronation as a contributor to plantar fasciitis is untrue. What the research does show is that custom orthotics have no measurable benefit over prefabricated orthoses and that prefabricated, aka store-bought inserts, may even be better as they provide superior cushioning over rigid plastic custom orthoses. Night splints. Again, the jury is out on night splints. While some studies have reported benefit, others have reported no difference if they're used or not. With the plantar fascia and the plantar intrinsic muscles being multi-joint structures, if actually effective, splints would require extension of the toes as well as dorsiflexion of the ankle to place stretch on the structures. But again, my question goes back to the claim that overstretching causes plantar fasciitis. Well, which is it? Does stretching cause it or fix it? Following that logic, it's like saying fire burns the skin, but more fire will fix it. It just doesn't make any sense. Surgery. There is a lack of high quality evidence to support surgical interventions. Common procedures are release of the plantar fascia or neurolysis, the destroying of plantar nerves. 
A large cohort study indicated that 70% of patients showed improvement following surgery, but only 50% of patients had complete satisfaction. Additionally, there are consequences for the complete division of the plantar fascia, including getting flat feet, bunions, and hammer toes, which all require the use of orthotics for the rest of your life. None of these treatments seem to be the magic fix for plantar fasciitis. Even the most commonly recommended treatments have relatively poor research to support their use. It's pretty clear that something has been missed. If the cause of plantar fasciitis was actually damage to the plantar fascia, the treatments mentioned above would in theory be appropriate. But it seems that one of two things have happened. Either the best treatment options have not been discovered yet and we are way off the mark, or we're misdiagnosing the root cause of plantar fasciitis and trying to treat it with the wrong things. I believe that it's going to be the latter. The plantar aponeurosis, aka the plantar fascia, and the underlying intrinsic muscles are incredibly close in anatomic location. So close in fact that it's very difficult to separate the two in cadaver dissection. And while these intrinsic muscles have specific functions related to the movements of the toes, they also assist the plantar fascia in supporting the arch of the foot. Plantar intrinsic foot muscles provide stability, shock absorption, and help transfer ground forces efficiently. The location and function of plantar intrinsic muscles and the plantar fascia are so closely related it is impossible to isolate them. There are many muscles in the foot, but three muscles are directly connected to the plantar fascia. The flexor digitorum brevis, abductor hallucis, and the abductor digiti minimum. During walking and running, these muscles contract during weight transfer to the forefoot and toes, assisting in propulsion providing stability to push off. These muscles are placed under high load repetitive forces with every step, and these forces are further increased with running. The attachment of these muscles, the calcaneal tuberosity, also happens to be the exact location that some people develop heel spurs, and it's also the point where providers press to diagnose plantar fasciitis. Bone growth and tendon attachments occur when there is repetitive contraction of a muscle which pulls on the bone. This type of bone growth usually occurs in high load bearing attachments like the foot or the knee. Common examples are auschwitz schlatter's and Seavers disease. It seems likely that the plantar pain at the heel is just, if not more likely, to be due to the plantar muscles repeatedly pulling on the bone. Heel spurs are shown to have a poor relation to plantar fasciitis and actually occur deep or below the plantar fascia. As discussed in part 3, while some diagrams have the plantar fascia starting right at the medial calcaneal tuberosity, it also extends further attaching to the heel bone below the fat pad of the heel. The plantar aponeurosis does have some fiber attachments around the medial aspect of the calcaneal tuberosity. However, by design, its attachments are spread out so that it can disperse the forces over a greater area. This helps protect it from being damaged. Think of one person standing on a bridge trying to hold up a car with one rope versus 50 people each holding a rope attached to the car. With 50 points of contact, there is less focal stress, and it's much easier to hold up the car as each person takes on part of the stress. Because of this, the plantar fascia and its larger surface area attachments are much less likely to suffer injury. Additionally, the plantar fascia, or aponeurosis, by design is an incredibly fibrous structure capable of tolerating high and repetitive stress. Based upon the suspect reliability of the diagnoses, the unclear causes of plantar fasciitis, and the structure of the plantar aponeurosis, I believe a majority of plantar fasciitis diagnoses are in fact a proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy. This is the result of damage to the tendon or tendons of the plantar foot muscles and not the plantar fascia. There is little crossover in the treatments and the treatments for plantar fasciitis have little to no effect on proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy. This also helps explain why people struggle with it for such a long time. Plantar fasciitis treatments are not effective for a tendinopathy. So let's do a quick review. We have a condition whose causes are not entirely clear other than that it appears to be related to overload or overstretching. Its diagnostic criteria are flawed, relying on palpation and imaging studies with a 4mm thickness standard that has been proven to appear in people without pain. The underlying intrinsic muscles are directly connected to the plantar fascia and perform some of the same functions. And finally, the treatments used for plantar fasciitis have minimal effect. With all that, it seems more than likely that providers are mistakenly diagnosing plantar fasciitis when it is more likely to be a proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy. All right, we've given you a lot to digest over the last few videos, but we hope that it has made sense so far. 
If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments and we'll do our best to answer them. We have one video left and that's the one that's going to help you understand why you can't seem to get rid of it and what you should be doing to speed your recovery. All tissue like muscles, tendons, ligaments, bones, skin, etc. have a certain level of force that it can tolerate and will only get injured when you exceed its tolerance to force. That could be a one-time high force such as a fall or a car accident, or a low-level repetitive force such as an overuse injury. When tissue is damaged, its tolerance to forces is temporarily decreased. In this injured state, activities that would normally be tolerated now result in damage. Healing has essentially three phases. The first phase is the inflammatory phase. This phase typically lasts three to seven days provided that the tissue is not re-injured. The cardinal sign of the inflammatory phase is constant symptoms. Inflammation is a chemical process, much like a fever, in that you can't turn it on and off. At any time if you can get into a position, say sitting, and you have no symptoms, you can't be in the inflammatory phase. Once symptoms become intermittent, you are in the next phase called the reparative or proliferation stage. In this stage, the body is rebuilding the damaged structures and there will be no symptoms unless you exceed the tolerance of the repairing tissue. This is also the stage where most people get in trouble. Because there is no pain at rest or with very low level activities, people assume they are okay to resume normal activities. The problem is that the absence of pain at rest is no indication that the tissue is strong and can tolerate your normal activities. People try and return to normal activities which then damages the tissue and puts them back into the inflammatory phase. They take it easy for a few days and the symptoms get better. And then they try again. And around and around they go with periods of no symptoms and periods of pain. Unfortunately, it can be impossible to tell if you've overdone it until the next day. And because of this, slow and gradual progression of activity is required. A sudden increase in activity can easily overload the tissue and restart the process all over again. As time goes on, the injured tissue becomes stronger and stronger and thus more tolerant of forces, moving into the remodeling or maturation stage. During this phase, the collagen fibers that were laid down in a disorganized fashion are reorganized. Gradual and progressive loading helps this process, but the process takes time and requires consistency and a continued progression of forces. So what should you do and when? We have a plantar fasciitis program available at our website mehab.net but we're going to cover some of the important rules to follow and also give you a link to a special video on the top 10 things to know about recovering from a tendinopathy. So here are our top tips. Number one, deload or unload. If you have pain at rest, meaning it hurts all the time, not just some of the time, I mean all the time that you're awake, you must unload or deload your foot. It means you're in the inflammatory phase. The tissue has very poor tolerance to force. Even just standing could be too much force and cause more damage delaying recovery. Depending on the severity of the damage and the associated decrease in tissue tolerance, you may not be able to put any weight on the foot at all. Or maybe it'll be able to handle a little bit of stress and you could use crutches. It's going to vary from person to person. Only you have the ability to figure that out. It's hard and it sucks, especially if you're working or have other responsibilities. But it is crucial to give the tissue time to move through the phases of healing. Unload it. Don't stretch it. Don't rub it. Don't try and walk it out. Rest and unload until your symptoms become intermittent, meaning no pain at rest in an unloaded position. It will serve you so much better in the long run. Number two, be consistent. The key to achieving full recovery, as with any goal, is to stay consistent and work on it every day. Don't look for the quick fixes or a miracle pill or ointment. They are not supported by evidence. But if you are going to use them anyways, make sure they are a supplement to the meat and potatoes of your recovery, which is consistent and progressive loading. They should never be used as a replacement for the core work that is required. Number three, be patient. Tendinopathies take a long time to become pain-free, with pain improving around 12 weeks and full recovery taking around 24 weeks, if it is loaded progressively and appropriately. If you were very active prior to injury, expect to have a slightly longer recovery. It takes more time to get your tissue to tolerate higher forces. The stress of walking to a mailbox is nothing compared to a marathon runner or a triple jumper. 
Logically, it will take more time to return to those activities. Without a doubt, you're gonna get frustrated, but if you stick with it, you will recover. Number four, progress slowly. Don't rush your recovery or your return to your previous activities. If you try and return too fast, you will likely dump yourself back into the inflammatory stage and have to start all over again. Your body and tissue will tell you if you're progressing too fast. For example, if you walk for five minutes on one day, wait until the next day to see how you react. If your body can't tolerate the five minutes yet, it will be painful and sensitive the next day. So take the day off and make sure your symptoms are intermittent before trying again. Next time you try, try walking for three minutes. Wait and see how you feel the next day. As you progress slowly, your tissue will adapt and get more tolerant. Keep in mind that any stress placed on your foot is really an exercise and contributes to the daily cumulative amount. Be aware if you're tolerating 10 minutes of structured walking for four days straight, and then all of a sudden you get increased symptoms, it's likely to be something other than the walking that caused the flare. Maybe you carried something up and down the stairs or did some gardening, who knows, but think about any possible increased activity that you did the day before. Here are our top exercises. Ankle and toe pumps. Before you stand up either in the morning or after sitting, move your ankles and toes up and down 50 to 100 times or more. This will help get the tissue in your system ready to be active. The more active you can be before getting out of bed or getting up, the better. Do some exercises in bed before you put weight on your feet. Swing your arms, kick your legs, literally anything. Heel raises. Heel raises are the perfect exercise for recovery. They load the plantar muscles with the exact function that they perform during walking and running. Their intensity can be easily adjusted by switching between exercises in seated versus standing, two feet versus one foot, eccentric versus concentric focus, and even plyometrics. Stretching, but not your typical calf stretches, which are kind of pointless. They do put some small stress on the plantar intrinsic muscles, which is why they kind of work. In order to do them correctly, you need to have your toes extended while putting weight on your foot. Let me make it clear that you're not doing this to stretch those tissues. Placing weight on these muscles in this fashion is applying a tensile force. It is just another form of loading the structure. Walking is another perfect exercise where it replicates the function of the plantar intrinsic muscles and the intensity can be easily adjusted through the manipulation of duration and also incline. The key is to only increase duration every four to seven days to allow the tissue to adapt. If symptoms increase, wait until symptoms are intermittent and decrease your walking duration. So there we have it, our complete guide to plantar fasciitis, or as it likely should be called, a proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy. We hope you found the series valuable. If you did, please give us a like. We have a lot of great videos coming out, so please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.